It should come as no surprise to you that our planet is in a very bad shape. And I'm going to tell you how that is also affecting our health. How is our sick planet making us sick? This is the University of the Netherlands. Many of us take nature for granted. We see flowers blooming and we don't think twice about it. But for every flower that blooms and every fruit that we eat, there are pollinators, bees at work. We take the rain for granted, but that rain makes our garden and farms lush and green. All these flowers, fruits and rain allow us to live healthy lives, contribute to our welfare and well-being and even inspire our art and sciences. So nature is valuable. And the question is, should we put an economic price on nature? So what is the value of nature? Scientists have seen that if you look at nature and value it for the year 2007, it is worth 125 trillion US dollars for the year 2007. And in that year, it was worth more than twice the global gross domestic product. So although we depend on nature, we are also destroying nature. And this is sad because the sick planet makes us sick. Let me explain how sick our planet is. Now our planet is actually an interlinked system with land and water and oceans all interconnected. But it's easier to explain the story by talking about atmosphere, biodiversity, oceans, land and water. Now, if you look at atmosphere, the biggest problem is climate change. Already, the average global temperature has increased by one degree centigrade in relation to pre-industrial times. And this means that the glaciers are melting, the sea level is rising, the hydrological patterns of rainfall are changing, and we are exposed to extreme weather events. In terms of atmosphere, we also have two other problems, urban air pollution and rural household pollution. Many cities across the world are choked because of the environmental pollution in those cities. At the same time, rural households in developing countries often use traditional stoves to cook their food. And this basically means that they're exposing themselves to household air pollution. If you look at biodiversity, we are in the middle of the sixth worst extinction event. All kinds of species are dying out. We are overfishing our oceans. Our bees are affected. All kinds of large animals are being pushed out. And not only that, because the oceans are also affected by climate change, this means that the breeding grounds for fish are being affected. So not only are we overfishing, but climate change will have an impact on the fish populations. And of course, our oceans have turned into a plastic soup because all our plastic eventually ends up in these oceans. And if you look at land, land is increasingly being degraded. We keep deforesting land in order to grow plants for biofuels or for our meat industry or for exotic plants that we want to buy from far off places. And this basically means that we take more out of the land than we put back into the land, and that leads to the degradation of the existing land. If you look at water, 
Well, we are taking out clean water and throwing out dirty water. We're taking out water from under the ground faster than it can be replenished by rainwater. And this often leads land to sink as a consequence. The bottom line is that climate change and biodiversity are two areas in which we are crossing planetary boundaries. And this makes our planet sick, which affects us. If you look at climate change and just take the example of extreme weather events, between 2005 and 2015, 7 million people died as a consequence of extreme weather events and 1.7 billion people were affected by this. If you look at air pollution, well, urban air pollution and household air pollution cause about 7 million people to die annually. Water pollution causes 1.4 million people to die annually. Land degradation affects 3.2 billion people, their lives and their livelihoods. So, how do we solve the problem of a sick planet? To solve this problem, we need to understand the direct and the indirect causes of a sick planet. I identify three direct causes. First, the energy system. Many of us use fossil fuels in our houses and in our cars. And this leads to the emission of greenhouse gases, which is responsible for the climate change problem. Second, the food system. Many of us like to eat meat and fish and exotic products from all parts of the world. Moreover, we throw one third of our food away. And this creates a huge impact on the planetary system. Third, the resource use and disposal system. Most of us like to buy all kinds of new products and each product implies that you are taking resources from nature and dumping waste on nature. These three direct causes are embedded within four larger indirect structural causes. First, population. We expect that the global growth of population will reach around 10 billion. And of course, each person implies an additional pressure on the planet. A second indirect cause is our focus on gross domestic product or national income. Each society wants to produce more, sell more, consume more. And the more we want to produce, sell and consume, the more resources we need for nature and the more we dump onto nature. Third, technology. Technology is absolutely essential for making life more pleasurable. But at the same time, technology also contributes to destroying nature. For example, Technology helps us kill pests. That is very important if we want to grow food. And that food is important for food security. However, this use of pesticide also kills those bees. Not only that, pesticide residues on our apples and fruit also cause harm to our own human health. A fourth indirect driver or cause is urbanization. More people are moving from rural areas to urban areas. Now, on the one hand, this is good because maybe we live in a compact area in a city and there are economies of scale in our use of public transport or access to health services. But an urban lifestyle also brings aspirations and those aspirations may lead us to want to buy more products, have greater demands for recreation facilities and we want to travel more. So in many ways, urbanization also has a huge impact on the environment. So we have a sick planet with consequences for our health. But if we look at the current policies, these are nowhere in line with trying to achieve a healthy planet for healthy people. 
Now, of course, there are a whole lot of small win-win solutions available. But in order to protect the planet, we need structural change. And is this possible? I would argue that if we all put our minds to it, then individually and jointly, we can make the change that is necessary. If you look at ourselves individually, we could change our consumption patterns. Now, of course, most people worldwide do not consume much, but those of us who are wealthy, we could make a huge difference. But is it enough to save our planet? In order to save our planet, we need to do much more. And the problem is that there is some degree of political and economic resistance to such change. And this is related to three big challenges. First, if rich producers and rich consumers produce and consume less, this might have an impact on national income. And this is something that many governments would be reluctant to encourage. National governments are very focused on ensuring that national income goes up. In the end, it's all about money. And this really requires us to rethink the way we calculate our gross domestic product, our income, and the way our societies are structured. Second, it is not possible to recycle energy. Food recycling is very difficult, and most other products can be partially recycled. Third, if you look at the totality of our resources, let's take land, when well, land is limited. You take fresh water, fresh water is limited. Many strategic minerals like phosphorus are also limited. And at this current moment, we are using almost one and a half times our Earth. If we were to actually reduce our consumption of resources from our Earth in line with what is possible and within the carrying capacity of the Earth, this would require us to share resources. Sharing becomes even more important in a world where 1% of the world owns as much as the remaining 99%. We will need to make rules regarding how we share the earth. These three problems require us to focus on structural change. But clearly, powerful actors will not be quite so willing to accept this message. One of the problems here is that most national leaders in democratic societies are in power for only four to five years. And this basically means that they do not have a long-term vision. The chief executive officers of the Fortune 500 companies are mostly CEOs for only a period of three to four years. So they too don't have a long-term vision. Now, while non-governmental organizations may have a long-term vision, they do not have the resources to push for change. And as a consequence, we are seeing the rise of social movements. Extinction Rebellion, Fridays for Future, and thousands of other smaller social movements are moving worldwide to change policies in relation to the environment, and they are demanding social and ecological justice. At the start of this lecture, I focused on the question, how is our sick planet making us sick? Think back to the billions of people that have suffered as a consequence of an unhealthy planet. Think also of the number of small things we can all do. Eat less meat, use public transport, use the cycle, but all these small things together may not be enough. So we also have to push for bigger things. We have to push for and demand a change in the economic system. Because in the end, we need a healthy planet for all to live a healthy life. Thank you.